anything you have, freely we received. Freely give it away. The love that we receive freely from the saints of God or from God himself, give it away. Give, give, give. So what we were talking about last week is things we sh- that we should pray and things we should do. There's, as I told you, there's so many that I, I figured I better write this down because, you know, we're responsible for the Word of God. And the way we steward through the Word of God is we're, we're taking it and we're applying it. So we're a student of the Word. It's not just what we hear on Sunday. It's the things the Holy Spirit inspires us what are the sins that God hates? You may get asked that question, and you, then it's up to you whether you're interested enough to start digging. And I will tell you that as evil as Google may be, it often helps you with spirit-filled things. You say, I need to know all the scriptures on uh, things God hates. Well, it has them there for you, thanks to some sweet soul. So last week we talked about things that we should do, and one thing was strengthen the inner man. The other thing was to sacrifice ourselves for God and for others. A lot of people don't feel like the sacrifice for others is essential, but it actually is. It's by that that people, that people can tell we belong to him. And then giving financially is something we do that he, that he himself judges whether we're giving appropriately. The, the thing I want to start with today is something that is a, a word that is, the word is surrender. We're supposed to surrender. Now you say, I don't really know what that means. You know, I'm living my life. What does it mean to surrender? So we may have the Holy Spirit. Let's assume that you have the Holy Spirit. And why is the Holy Spirit so important? Because you cannot be led of the Spirit. You can be drawn by the Spirit. But to be led of the Spirit, the Bible says that once Jesus, once it was spoken over Jesus, you know, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased following. He was filled with the Spirit at that moment, the Bible says. He was filled with the Spirit. And at that moment was the first time we read that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And what was he led to do? To be tested. So, isn't that interesting? We assume if we're tested by something, it's all the devil's work. But the Holy Spirit tests us because until we can receive um, gifts and callings and, and dreams and visions, he wants to know, can I trust you? It's like, how do you build trust with the person that you want to trust? Like, I love this person so much. I want them to be my new best friend and I want them to be my best friend. And so you, some people, the first thing to do is tell them something really huge that happened in their life that they would only trust their closest friend with. Big mistake. Because trust is earned, so you put a little, you get, what you should do when you're trying to make a friend of somebody you already love and you already think, I already want this person in my life. I love them so much, but you only know them, not as super close, but you just know of them. And you love all the things you know of them. A lot of times we think of celebrities that way. Oh, if I could just be their best friend. So we don't really have a relationship, but we want one. And a lot of times people think relationship is won by telling something deeply, deeply important. And that from that um, vulnerability will breed this special relationship. I'm not talking about sharing your story in a group full of people. I'm telling you, when you want that one-on-one relationship, don't ever start it that way. You give them a small, let's think about it as a bowl bowl of marbles, like a jar full of marbles. You give them a small nugget of information about you. And now you wait to see how they're going to hold that information. Are they trustworthy? Do they tell your friends? Um, and then you, you think, I think they did well with that. Then you tell them another little piece. And it's when you tell them little pieces of this that you become trustworthy. Well, the Holy Spirit does the same thing. It, 
it gives us tests so that we know. It, like the Holy Spirit knows, can I trust them with this piece of information? Because not everything the Holy Spirit tells us are we to share. Some things are too precious. And the Lord only wants them revealed when people seek him. If, and, and, you know, I, I've had to be careful about that myself. I said, Lord, put a stop sign. Don't let me share something that is your secret. So um, that's one thing we're to do is surrender. And surrender um, is relinquishing, relinquishing possession or control to another. Now, the Holy Spirit, to relinquish, relinquish your own control, what does that look like in everyday life? Let's say that you want to be led of the Holy Spirit that day, but you do have to go to the grocery store. You do have to go by the post office, and you have to get some chores done around the house. So surrendering is, is bending your knee and saying, Lord, or surrendering yourself, however the way you feel, and saying, Lord, I surrender this day to you. I have to get this done, but lead me to the right grocery store that you have someone or lead me to the right place throughout this day that I can be used by you. Because, you know, along your way, you might have your favorite grocery store, but when you're surrendered to the Holy Spirit, on the way back from the post office, he may open your eyes to a Lowe's or something you're not used to going to. And if you feel like, "Mm, maybe I should do my grocery shopping there. It's a surrendering of your own day. And, and that trust will grow as you do little things. So sometimes you do something that doesn't seem important to you, but the Holy Spirit was testing you. Will you follow my leading? Will you do what I ask you to do even when you don't understand? So that's what we call surrender. So surrender is not saying, I'm just standing here all day until you come. It's saying, this is all the things I have to get accomplished. Lead my steps or order my steps and prepare me for that moment when you're going to bring someone or point me to a situation that you're going to use me. Okay? The other thing that is really odd, and no one ever talks about this, is we're supposed to forgive people's sins. Now, that's very strange. It doesn't seem like it's popular. But this is the way it worked. Right after Jesus was risen and the disciples just find out that the tomb, the stone has been rolled away, he comes to show himself to his disciples to empower them and say, everything I told you now is in action. And he blows upon them and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And then the last thing he says to him as he leaves is, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you withhold forgiveness for anyone's sins, their sins are not forgiven. So though we may not understand every aspect about what he was talking about, we're supposed to do the things that Jesus did and said. And right here he says, forgive people their sins. So I just think of it as like Job or something, you know. I think of someone, I'm going, Lord, forgive their sins. They don't know you as good as they should. God, they don't know what they're doing to you. In Jesus' name, forgive their sins and lead them into all righteousness. Wouldn't you want to rather be safe than sorry? The Bible says forgive their sins and they shall be forgiven. We don't understand all the aspects of that because we know salvation comes to the individual. But he said to do it. So we better do it. And the next thing he says is is draw near to God. How do you do that? You draw near to God by cleansing your heart, your hands, your mind, purifying your minds from being double-minded, from doubtful things. You know, the Bible says consecrate yourself. So you're reading the word, you're applying the word to yourself, and you're trying to... um, Draw near with a sincere heart. The Bible says, with a, sincere, with a sincere heart, but with full assurance of faith. So you're doing it with the knowledge of, I don't have to, you know, he has forgiven me. You're doing it with the full knowledge that I'm just, I'm doing this as an act, as a meaningful relationship to consecrate myself to the Lord. And to purify myself from an evil conscience an evil conscience, and to purifies our bodies as, as if washed with pure water. So we're 
Let's go. This brings us back to that one thing that the Bible says were, um, if I can remember where it was, but it was purifying yourself. Where Jesus, it said that Jesus was, the word is submission. He was horrified at the very thought of offending God. Right? Remember that part that we talked about last week? So the submission part, that doesn't sound like he was saying, um, well, whatever, um, that doesn't, that's not him saying, well, it, I'm, I'm, I might get drunk tonight or I might do this simple thing tonight, but I'm going to repent the minute I'm done. That's not horrified. Horrified from being separated. That is deep respect. I'm horrified at being separated from the Lord, from my, from my source. So just remember that when you're planning sin ahead of time. Um, the Lord will recognize you're not horrified at being separated from him. And he may stay calm longer than you wanted him to. And I'm not saying that he won't forgive you. But you, sometimes he, let, he lifts his presence off you, and you'll walk in quietness for a while from him, and you won't hear anything. A couple things of what we should do. So those were things we should do. Here's a few things we should pray. We need to worship and give thanks and be grateful. Now, that's not that hard, but it's actually very, very hard because we focus on what not to be thankful for. And then time spent alone. So the consecration is, though it is something we're supposed to do, it's, always, it's also something we do in prayer through repentance, through submission and consecration to the Lord. So here's some more things to pray, that the Lord sends labors into the field. The Lord says, pray with your voices lifted up together to God. So that's what we do when we take extra time to worship. Your voices are being lifted up together with God. We're to pray and say, not thy will, but not my will, but thine be done. The devil will try to trick you with that every time. He tries to get you to say it opposite. Not my will, but thine be done. And then he and, and we are supposed to quote scriptures. And memorize them to our heart, meditate upon them. What would that be? A scripture, you're reading your chapter for the day, a scripture jumps out at you, and you just say it more times throughout the day and let it just sit inside your, inside your heart until it becomes a living thing that you begin to feel the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's all we got time for. I, this list is unending, but, you know, unless we remind ourselves, we got problems. In Jesus' name, help us to do all the things we need to do and help us to pray all the things we need to pray. Amen. Good word. Good word. Let's, let's stand together. Thank you, sweetheart. That's all so helpful. Things that's so easy to overlook if you're not careful. I looked at my watch a couple of times, not because I was worried about the time, because it was buzzing me. It thinks I'm exercising. And that I stop for some reason. Someone needs to create a worship app. It zaps you when you're still for too long. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to dismiss our Sunday school at this time. God bless you. God bless our guests and visitors. Why don't we give all of our guests a round of applause? You make, us, you make our day by being with us today in the house of the Lord. read from Genesis chapter number uh, three. And verses 22 through 24. Then we're going to go to Exodus 26 and 31, Matthew 27 and 50. And the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden 
to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Exodus chapter 26, verse 31, And thou shalt make a veil of blue. These are the instructions for the construction of the tabernacle. This is the veil in particular. Uh, Make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims. Shall it be made? Everyone say cherubims. Here they are again. Matthew 27, verse 50 through 51. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You know, the King James says rent, but I don't want to read the word rent since you... Start looking around, wonder if your landlord showed up to come get you. So I thought it'd be read something a little easier to understand. But it means torn. The veil in the temple, this is the one with the cherubims on it, was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split. I want to preach from the subject, tearing the veil. Precious God, we thank you for the power of your spirit today. We pray that the Holy Ghost would anoint the word of God and let it penetrate our hearts and minds in the lovely name of Jesus, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Smile at someone and you may be seated. I didn't say laugh at him, I said smile at him. Everybody say, Jesus Jesus. tore the veil. I don't know how you choose, so I suppose we, depending on whatever disposition you may have, Jesus will be that that you need him to be. If you need a father, he'll be your father. If you need a friend, he'll be your friend. If you need a lawyer, he'll be your counselor. If you need encouragement, he'll be an encourager. And if you need a barrier breaker, if you're walled in, if you're surrounded by problems, he'll break the barrier down that stands between you and your destiny. Jesus is and was, even in his dying breath, a barrier breaker. Perhaps it's not evident to you that the veil was a barrier that prevented men from encountering the glory of God. But even in his dying moments, Jesus shredded a curtain that they say is so thick that teams of oxen pulling in either direction would not have the power to tear it. But Jesus tore it. Because he's a barrier breaker. That's how desperate he is for the glory to get to where you are. And if there's anything that's separating you from the glory, let the Lord of glory tear it in two this morning. Would you put your hands together? Now, in the physical realm, it takes time to build a wall. And conversely, it takes almost no time at all to tear a wall down. Hence the famous words of President Reagan, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And of course, when the tearing commenced, in a matter of no time, a wall that had stood and separated uh, Berlin in two was... uh, was torn down, and of course, liberty began to flow to communist uh, nations of uh, the USSR and so on and so forth. 
But in the realm of the Spirit, so let me say this again, in the physical realm, it takes a long time to build a wall, and it takes almost no time at all to tear a wall down. But in the realm of mind and spirit, but in the realm of the mind and of the spirit, it takes a long time to build a wall, and sometimes even longer to tear it down. Hence, people that come into the church that receive the Holy Ghost are still battling with the same confidence, lack of confidence issues. Encumbered with some of the same dysfunctions. Hindered by some of the same fears. Can I tell you that those fears and those defense mechanisms, they weren't erected in a day. And though the Holy Ghost will do a lot of heavy lifting, it's not going to do everything. It won't put your shoes on for you because the angel said, I'll get you out of jail, but you're going to have to tie your own shoelaces, okay? So it takes time to tear down walls that alienate us from people, that alienate us from God, Amen. That alienate us sometimes from our own selves. I'm talking about a God who can tear down barriers today. And so it goes, the story of Genesis goes uh, like this. When Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit and their eyes were opened and they were introduced to another domain and that God now because of this disobedience had to extricate, that means remove them from the tree of life. It was not permissible. It was not legal in the realm of spiritual things for fallen men to partake of a tree that would cause their immortality. Because the state of sin is such a state that you don't want them to live forever like this. Praise God. And so the angel, uh, the cherubim, God raises up a, a fiery angelic wall with these cherubim brandishing flaming swords to prevent Adam and Eve and their descendants from ever returning back to the garden and to especially the tree uh, of life. And so here we are today on the dark side of the angelic realm. And what I want to preach about is how God brought us from the same side of the angels that Adam and Eve found themselves on in Genesis 3 to the other side. Hallelujah. Does anybody want to get to the other side? I want, to get, I want to get to the other side of that forbidden angel. Praise God. There's a place in God where you can get on the other side of the judgment and you can be in the place of blessing and of power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to say this. Somebody is going to get on the other side of an angel today. So... It was quite a project, like I said, to build a wall takes time, but in the realm of the Spirit, to tear down a wall takes even longer than it takes to build sometimes. So in the in the writings of 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 David, it was said that the Lord deviseth means to bring the banished home. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they created a dilemma. And that was God had to formulate a means by which he could reintroduce them to the glory that they had had forfeited by their disobedience. And so God had to come to where we were. The scripture puts it this way, he was made a little lower than the angels. So hear me, we're on the outside. The angels that are defending the glory are between us and the glory. And in order to help humankind, God himself had to robe himself, 
Philippians 2, he, he who was equal with God made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And in the likeness of men, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So God had to get on our side. And in order to get on our side, he had to be born into the human experience Thus, in Bethlehem, that day, there was born in and, and that was wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. The very God of creation now has become one of us. So I want you to see this Lord of glory. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. He came to His own. He came to His own. His own received Him not, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Let me tell you something. And this Word was made manifest. It was manifest in flesh, and we beheld his glory. So God had to come to our world. I told you about the time I had a credit card uh, kickback. I was with my son, and he was, this was several years ago. He didn't have much money. And, and you, know, you know, I know you've never had a credit card max out on you. Okay, forgive me like my wife said. And I was getting something, and the credit card didn't work. And, you know, I did like you do. Oh, I can't tell them I'll call that bank. I don't know what's wrong. Here, I got another one. Use this. And I looked over at Jordan. He has this big smile on his face, and he says, Welcome to my world. <laughs> All I can say is, Jesus, welcome to our world. You loved us enough. You cared enough. Amen, that you, you traversed time and space and eternity and you vacated your throne and you wrapped yourself in this messy flesh like we have and then you did for us what we couldn't do. Watch this. The Lord had to get us on the other side of those angel walls, of those barrier walls. And he said, this way, everybody. But the deal of it was he had to sacrifice. He had to take the hit. He had to go down under the power of the judgment that was leveled against the sinful mankind. He had to pay the price for our sin, though he himself was not sinful, so that he could make a way for us to get on the other side of those angels. I want to tell you something. We have no excuse not to be a worshiper today. Jesus made it possible for you to enter the Holy of Holies. And so the veil with those cherubim was rent from top to bottom, granting access to the holy of holies where only the high priest encountered the glory of God once a year. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Sometimes, I'm going to tell you, God, you say, how many has ever been, how many has been through some stuff? Well, you hadn't been through half as much as Jesus went through. Historians say that the veil was dyed a rich color of purple. And in order to get the purple dye, they had to crush the shells of 12,000 snails called Murex snails. I don't know how many 12,000 snails, goodness. 12, it'd be a truck, dump truck full probably of snails. Not roadrunners, snails. How would you like waiting on a snail to get the job done? And so he, it takes, it, it, I, I want to, you know, it's not some small thing for the Lord to create a way to get you into the presence and into the glory of the Lord. Just think, in order for the Father to restore the lost soul 
of his departed son. In order to get the prodigal back to where he used to be, God had to overcome the barriers of time. Sometimes people have to be given space to make their own mistakes. And the father waited and waited and waited. Come on, God is, God is so patient that the scripture warns us, don't think that God is slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering. Time, distance. He didn't just go to the next county. He went to a far country. Depletion. He had to wait until the boy went absolutely broke on the, on the monies that he got from his own father's estate. He had to break down the barrier of animosity because once the prodigal had been gone so long and gone so far that when he came back, the saints had trouble receiving him back in... Oh, I, The elder brother said, hmm, what is he doing back at church? Same thing you're doing back at church. Only the difference is we know about his sins, but yours are still secret. Watch this. So he had to break down barriers of time, distance, depletion of resources, animosity of the saints. And he also had to initiate affection. How do you help a boy who forgot how to love? How do you love someone who doesn't love themselves? I'll tell you what you do. You run to where they are. You put your arms around them and you smother them with kisses. Praise God. I'm so glad that we don't have to love ourselves first to be saved. We are here because he first loved us. And so he had to demonstrate and initiate affection and declaration. This is my son who was once dead, but is now alive. Oh, my. Do you say, I don't know who I should be friends with at the church. Find somebody who knows how to speak over you blessings in your destiny. Stay away from those that curse your present and your future. This is my, I, I don't want anyone to lie to me. Okay, I was dead, but now I'm alive in Jesus Christ. Don't lie to me, but tell me what I can be if I'll let God be first in my life. Amen. Covering, put a robe on him. Shodding, put shoes on his feet. Sacrifice, kill the fatted calf. Music, start up the band. Celebration, let's throw a party. Restoration of authority, give him the ring on his finger. And re-education of the brother, elder brother, who still had a bad spirit even until this moment. Like I said, it's not easy to bring someone back from the dead. But God is in the business of bringing many sons to glory. Oh, hallelujah. I got to tell you. And so he's got that, he had on Calvary to tear down that veil. Woo. And I want to sort of uh, rewrite what Reagan said, and I want to say, saints of God, tear down that veil. Come on, Jesus wants to tear. Let me tell you this. Uh, we are so fixated on getting to the upper room and getting into the glory that we think that we've arrived uh, when we get the Holy Ghost. You haven't done much more when you get the Holy Ghost in the upper room uh, than the high priest experienced uh, in the Holy of Holies. 
Here's the difference between the Old Testament and the New among many other things. And that is we don't just get in the glory, but we tear down the veil and take the glory out to a lost and dying world with us. It's not enough to just get the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost needs to get you. Oh, put your hands together, somebody. Oh, I feel the presence of God in this place. I feel the hand of God in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Are you ready for this? Moses said, show me your glory. Anywhere that there is glory, there is a protector of the glory. God said, I, Moses, show me your glory. You know what he got? A blindfold. <laughs> Because God was defending the glory. He put the glory in the Holy of Holies. And he tells Moses, put a thick veil to separate that place from the rest of the tabernacle. And only one man, once a year, is able to go through there. And on either side of the ark are cherubim. And woven on the veil are cherubim. Show me where there's glory, and I'll show you where there's angels. Oh, my God. All right. And so Isaiah said, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above the throne were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two wings they covered their feet. And with two wings they flew, and they were calling out to one another holy 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 is the lord god almighty the whole earth is filled with his glory show me where there's glory and i'll show you that that's where there are angels in ezekiel Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. In Ezekiel chapter number 10, verse number 18. Then the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted their wings and rose above the earth while I watched. And they went out along with their wheels and stood at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's temple as the glory of Israel's God remained above covering them. Where there is glory, there are angels. And so in the book of Revelation, it is a panoramic tour of the heavenly realm. And at every turn, there's an angel in the first chapter that says, John, write down the things that you're being told. There's an angel in the fifth chapter when the book that nobody could open, amen, was opened by the lion of the tribe of Judah. In 511, there's at least some, say, a hundred million angels singing and praising for angels in chapter 7. There are angels in chapter 8 that are used to answer apothecary angels that take the incense and take the prayer and mix them together and toss it to the earth and there's a rumbling and a shaking. What am I trying to say? Wherever there's glory, there's angels. And what do I say? I was worshiping. I literally saw a see-through arm right beside me going like this. And I said, Lord, what was that? And he said, it's a defender of the glory. I said, what do you mean? He said, this experience you have is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Show me where God puts the Holy Ghost. And I'll show you an angel that protects his investment. Oh, my God. There's an angel, I'm going to tell you, there's an angel watching over every one of you. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Uh, and the angels desire to look into this. Woo! Defend the glory, defend the glory, defend the glory, defend the glory. You don't want to get on the wrong side of an angel. You don't want to get on the wrong side. I'm going to throw my watch away in a minute. 
uh-oh, I'm okay. It's called an emergency. Lord, things are bad in here, but not that bad. You don't want to get on the wrong side. My, my, my. The veil was the last of a series of barriers of entry that were destroyed by Jesus Christ to make a way. And so, tear the veil. Too many times we think of ourselves, we understand we're the temple of the Holy Ghost, but we don't understand we're the tabernacle of David, not the tabernacle of the congregation. What is the difference between the tabernacle of the congregation? The tabernacle of the congregation was Moses' tabernacle. That's where the veil shut the glory out from the people. When David brought back the Ark of the Covenant and every six steps they sacrificed and they sang and they worshiped and Saul's daughter got a bad spirit, David took that glorious uh, Ark and took it to Jerusalem and put it in a tent with no veil. And around that tent was worshipers and choristers and musicians and singers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it was known as the tabernacle of David. You are not the tabernacle of the congregation. You are the tabernacle of David. It has no veil. Tear down that veil and let the glory loose. We got that old song, I've got it, I've got it, <clears throat> I've got it. You know what we need to sing? I release it, I release it, da, da, da. something about the power of the Holy Ghost. When I release it, does the most, I release it. Oh, come on, release it, release it, release it, release. Don't you know that's where the miracle is? Release it. The ark stayed in David's tabernacle for 40 years. And it wasn't until the building of Solomon's temple was it removed from the tent into the temple. And in Acts chapter number 15, I'm going to close with this. Never has the disciples or the apostles of the Lord been in any greater agreement, in my opinion, than in Acts chapter 15. The backstory here is there were Judaizers that were Holy Ghost filled. Jewish church members that wanted to ensnare the Gentiles into Mosaic ritual. What they wanted to do was to take the new converts that were coming out of paganism and turn them into the tabernacle of the congregation. They wanted them to have a church spirit. And so listen what happens. Peter preaches in Acts 15 and 6 and 8. We can put that up there. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made a choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts and bear them witness giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Woo. Verse number 12, Then Paul and Barnabas began to speak of the miracles which God had done. Then the multitude kept silence. They were spellbound by the testimony of Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Then comes James in verse 13. Then James said, and the scripture says, after this, they had held their peace and James answered saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Give me the next verse. After this, the Lord said, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. Verse 17, so that the rest of mankind, whew, 
so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things. Let me say this. They all came together on this one point. It's not about excluding people based on their nationality, on their origin, on their appearance, on their ecumenical status, on their economical status, on their spiritual background. Uh, this is an open house. Uh, this is the restoration of the tabernacle. We're not building Solomon's temple. We're building David's tabernacle where the glory is free and available to whosoever will. Oh my God. <laughs> what are you saying? We do well when we take our worship outside. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Woo. So no veil means you can't, just, you can't just take the glory in without letting the glory out. I want us to stand. There's no veil. You're a tabernacle of David rebuilt if you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You can't take it in. I, say, I find myself saying this when I'm praying for people to receive the Holy Ghost. Just, just let it out. Just let it pour through you. We need to take some of our own medicine. We need to stop this language of I got a good blessing today. Why don't we talk this way? I let out a good blessing today. Isn't that what Jesus said? Out of your belly shall flow. Out, 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 out. Out. I want to say this one last thing and we'll conclude here. When David set, took the ark to Jerusalem, two things happened. The tabernacle of David was the center of worship and it was the center of government. Laws, rules, and governmental dictums were come forth from that city as well as Worship and praise and music and singing and dancing and shouting. And I want to say this. Our authority, if we have any, is going to come from the level of our willingness to connect with God in worship. Show me someone who knows how to worship God. I'll show you someone. Devils tremble when they begin to pray. I want to say this to someone who feels like your life is completely out of control. And it's like, and it's like, it's, you're like a car that's just flown off a cliff and you're just tumbling and you, you can't seem to get any control. And all you do is worry and fear and fret and rehearse the most negative possible outcomes. You can break that cycle of negativity today. You want to know how? Lift your hands in the presence of God and become a worshiper. And as you begin to worship, you're going to find that all of a sudden you have control over your emotions and your circumstances can't tell you how to feel anymore because now you're connected with the Creator. And with the power of worship, you literally can speak to the chaos that's in your world and say in Jesus' name, stop. Stop and stop right here and right now. Does anybody want that kind of authority in your life? I want you to come down the aisle with your hands in the air and begin worshiping. Hallelujah. Worship your way to a place of power and authority over your circumstances.